All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Jamie Sweeting and I'm the pleasant, uh, president of uh, Planetera, a nonprofit organization that is seeking to uh, work with communities around the world uh, uh, to engage them in tourism, uh, what we call community tourism, uh, and, and help fight poverty. Um, I'm really lucky today that I'm uh, joined by uh, Jamie Clark, uh, Global Explorer, uh, author, public speaker, and uh, a friend and supporter of Planetera. Hi, Jamie. Jamie, good to see you. Thank you very much for having me, and hello to everybody. Yeah, it's exciting to have you here. So, um, as you know, um, we are uh, just embarking uh, on uh, the Planetera Trek Challenge, which is a virtual hike uh, uh, to Everest Base Camp. Um, and uh, those of us, our viewers, um, uh, the reason we've asked Jamie to join us today is that Jamie's actually, uh, as I understand it, Jamie, you've, you've hiked uh, uh, to Everest uh, on uh, the Everest base camp hike about a dozen times. Uh, you've actually climbed Everest four times and, and reached the summit twice. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Jamie, that is correct. Yes, sir. That, that just, yeah. I, I, I kind of need to say that again. He's, he's hiked about a dozen times to Everest Base Camp. He's uh, uh, climbed Everest twice, uh, uh, four times and, and reached the summit twice. And I, I, I just feel very blessed to, to have this conversation with you, Jamie, and share with, with our viewers. Um, so, so, you know, they're going, you know, we're all going to be, you know, doing this virtual hike, but what's it, what's it actually like doing the, the hike to base camp? Um, uh, you've done it a bunch of times uh, in, in, in se wearing several different hats. Um, uh, walk us through a little bit on the emotional, spiritual side of things. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 I imagine it's not just the physical activity of doing that hike. It's, there's a lot else that goes into it. It's, uh, I mean, you have to be careful not to use uh, too much hyperbole or, you know, cliche or, or talk in too silly of terms. But uh, so, you know, give me a little uh, leeway and permission uh, yourself and your listeners, viewers, because uh, I'm a bit biased. It really is a remarkable uh, place in the world. And, and the world is obviously filled with, with many, many, many of them. Uh, and I've had occasion to travel to every continent in my climbing career. Uh, but there is something very special about Nepal. And, and of course, we infuse that uh, in our own experience as well as what we encounter. You know, so much of our experience in any given place is what we bring to it. And I don't mean that in an egomaniacal way, but just in terms of one's uh, attitude and, and moment in life. But I've been really blessed, very, very fortunate, very privileged. Uh, to have been able to visit Nepal and, and make that trek. And it was a, a dream of mine as a young boy growing up here in, in the shadow of the Canadian Rockies in my home in Calgary. I can see him right through the window and uh, just spent the last four days uh, in those mountains. And uh, so mountain environments are, are something that I'm really drawn to the world over and Nepal in particular. And the trek to Everest Base Camp is from a climber's perspective, at least my perspective, is maybe the best part of an expedition. If you think about the average trip for me to climb Everest, and as you mentioned, four attempts, only twice to the summit. So, you know, I'm only 50% of the time any good. Uh, but years of effort, planning, preparation, training, you have eight weeks ahead of you at high altitude on the mountain. And then you have this beautiful, Track. Well, you, you leave Kathmandu, and depending how you get to the base of the trail, a, a bit of a scary, crazy flight into Lukla, and then you, uh, you know, take up your legs and start walking. And that journey, that 10, 11, 12 days, depending on how, how long you take, is arguably the best part of any expedition, I think, to the Himalaya, the walk to base camp, which is awesome because it's available to everybody. You don't have to be an expedition or Everest climber to, to enjoy it. Um, you hopefully you have able body to, to make the moves and vicariously in many ways, we all get to sort of enjoy that trek uh, in our own way. And it is, uh, sorry for the long answer, but it is the, for me, the most remarkable part of that journey. And it's a chance for your body to sort of get accustomed to the circadian rhythm of life that is mountain climbing the sun rises, you get to work, the sun sets, you get to rest. 
Sometimes you get up a little earlier than the sun and you stay out a little after it sets, but that's generally the rhythm. Same thing with trekking. There's no rush. It's slow and steady work. Day after day, hour after hour, minute to minute, step to step. It's very meditative. Uh, there's a wonderful rhythm to life there. And you're, it's steeped so richly in Sherpa culture. And the geography is just out of this world. So blah, blah. I can eat up our whole time, you know, waxing foolishly and philosophically about this trek. But in short, it's awesome. Fantastic. Now, a key difference, though, is for, for both our virtual trek and, and those that are, that are doing it as, as a traveler, you reach Everest Base Camp and, and you, you've, read, you know, you, you've reached your, 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 your destination. You're, 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 you've got the trek back, but you, you, you obviously have the euphoria of, of, of an, an incredible experience. So, but for you, the, uh, uh, you know, on the climbing trips, you're just getting started, right? I mean, you get to base camp and it's like, okay, work's, work's about to begin. Um, uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about you know, you know, as you say, a, a child who grew up in the Canadian Rockies and, and, and uh, certainly a, a mountaineer, mountaineer of, of, of great repute. You know, what, what is it about Everest that is just so special? Mm. And, and, and let's not take away anything from the accomplishment of getting into base camp. It's a serious piece of work. You know, you're going against uh, many obstacles. Elevation is significant. So you're only, you know, you're over 17,000 feet in base camp itself. So if your journey is just to trek there physically or virtually, that's a lot of elevation gain. It's no, uh, no mean feat. Uh, and, and, you know, you're on the other side of the world, depending on where you've traveled. So you're dealing with jet lag and, and elevation gain and maybe food that you're not accustomed to. So it's, it's taxing. And not just for a, a trekker, it's taxing for the Everest climber. You know, we're, we're very diligent about staying healthy on that trek in not going too fast so as not to court altitude sickness. You don't have to be at the extreme elevation to get altitude sickness. You get above Namchi Bazaar. Uh, these are little outposts in the valley that people become familiar with in the region. And you have to be thoughtful about how fast you go, how high you push your heart rate, uh, and how your body's adapting. So I've never been in there and just said, ah, yeah, no problem. We'll zip into base camp, bada bing. It's never the case. I, I've had trouble at lower elevations below base camp on that trek with altitude sickness. So got to be smart. The, but you are right. Once you get to base camp, um, then, you, you know, I guess you get serious about the climbing part. You've been serious about the adventure ever since you left Kathmandu. But now you're, you know, getting serious about the climbing portion. And Everest is... I think in some ways, maybe one could argue that uh, the currency of adventure has been devalued as a result of commercialization, as a result of guided climbs, as a result of overcrowding. There's a whole host of things, and that's maybe a whole other discussion for you and I to have. Um, but I tend to be a believer that you know, these mountains that surround us, me here in Calgary and wherever you are in the world, whatever mountain range may be in proximity, or the Himalaya, I'm a big believer in use, conscientious, thoughtful human visitation. Uh, that's, I believe, sort of a foundation for conservation. If you know a place and you care about a place, you'll want to protect it. Uh, if you visit a, a foreign land and understand the culture and know the people and care about the people, you'll want to help them, which is very much in part about what Planetera is all about. So. There's something pretty unique about Everest, and I don't care if you're the first or the 10,000th to, to kick your boots into the, to a, the side of it. Uh, it's it's a, a remarkable place. It should be respected. Um, when things go wrong, they go wrong really badly. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's no slouch of an effort. And it was something that caught my imagination as a kid. I read books about adventure as a kid. And if you have any interest in adventure, somehow a mountain has to factor into it. And if any mountain is on your mind, whew, Everest is going to show up somehow. So it's just this iconic, powerful place on the planet. And it, uh, it attracts the, the adventurous heart. So, I mean, I've had the pleasure of, of both you know, reading your book and, uh, and, and seeing the film uh, made about your, your journeys to, to Everest. And, I think one thing that really stuck with me is, I mean, there's obviously, uh, uh, you know, summiting Everest is, is, you know, there's endurance, there's 
planning there's there's um a, a whole management team to to get the whole expedition together uh, there's the physical nature of it but there's uh, a certain sort of spiritual nature that that comes through in 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 your work and um and you know obviously a lot of what planetera does is working to support um the livelihoods of of local people and and the role of the sherpa seems something that i i mean i i've read other books about everest and and um and things like that but in your work the the role of the sherpa and how important they those friendships have been to you was something that really jumped out can can you share a little bit with our audience about you know what what the role of the sherpa is both you know in terms of the the general trip but but to you personally yes well i think um i have much to be grateful for and indebted to and when it, when it comes to the sherpa community uh i think in the beginning of my career and and you know the honest reality was it was a very egomaniacal pursuit whether it was climbing these mountains here very destination oriented very much about the summit and i i don't think one can use uh you know being in your early 20s as an excuse for being a selfish jerk but <laughs> maybe a high performance or high achievement requires at least some of that in the recipe uh, but but i think if you trade on that constantly it it ends up in a very uh destructive sort of life life path and so even though in the beginning i was very much about the accomplishment about the destination i think traveling and having occasion to travel around the world taught me the value of the journey and thus you know my cliche warning it's not the destination it's the journey which is true however you know i when i didn't make it to the summit of everest the first two times i was pretty fired up about the destination so as in life it's kind of a mixture of both isn't it and one flows into the other journey and destination whether that's base camp or whether that's a summit and what i think influenced that understanding was my time with the sherpas being able to just have this realization that there was such joy in my friendships and spending time with them miles from the summit you know whether we were drinking some chang um which you know do so in moderation and usually only on your descent uh, it's a trip of beer made of rice uh, it, it can be quite quite strong in large quantities especially at high altitude there's a warning you know one drink at sea level is you know four at high high elevation so you're warned uh you know sitting in a sherpa home and, and meeting family and being welcomed in and then the occasion to go back and go back again and go back again and those relationships deepening and it really showed me that the the summit's value over time diminished in comparison to the overall experience and it was that overall experience that seems to be kind of flipped on itself where the summit was just really the excuse right trekking to ever space camp is just kind of the excuse to have this amazing experience not just while you're in country but prior to your departure you know you've set the goal for yourself that means you need to be fit and prepare and you're going to make better food choices and be more thoughtful uh, uh about your life leading up to the trip and making decisions to budget for this because it can be expensive it is expensive and making priorities do we get that new couch or do I take this trip do I want a richness of things or experience and and all of that was i guess a transformation of you know 25 plus full time years of doing of of global travel and the sherpa culture was really in the early 90s when i was first in uh, nepal and tibet and spending time with them that i began to realize that and so i owe them a tremendous amount for that sort of personal development even though it wasn't by design it was more by accident and as a result of that i have you know the, to speak of travel in spiritual ways it can get corny really quickly but uh i think you'd have to be nearly uh, some sort of a robot to go off and have a difficult experience and engage with a culture like the sherpas and not somehow be profoundly impacted and so not only were they you know climbing teammates um but they became friends so you know as you said uh, everest has really been a part of your life for for over 25 years now um what what's the best question anybody's ever asked you about everest um i i i imagine there's been a lot of not so great questions um 
<laughs> but what's one totally. that sort of you know jumps out at you as as being one that 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 you were like, yeah, that that was a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is hydration, by the way. This is water uh, that I'm drinking here, and uh, one of the keys to doing well at altitude is proper hydration. One of the keys to climbing ever virtually or otherwise is proper hydration. And by proper, I don't mean overhydrating, which can sometimes be the case, but primarily uh, making sure that you don't underhydrate. Maybe one of the best ways to ward off altitude sickness is to have good blood volume. Make sure that you're drinking enough water. Go easy on the coffee, though we love it. It's a diuretic, it's not healthy, it's not contributing to your overall fitness. Sure, the caffeine is a buzz, who doesn't enjoy that? Water, that can be one of the keys to climbing in the Himalaya. And what's great here, Jamie, is unlike on the side of a mountain where you have to go and fire up a stove and melt some snow, it's an effort to gain access. For many of us watching this, listening, we can walk to a tap and pour it out. It doesn't even need to come out of some fancy bottle that we've paid ridiculously for. Uh, tap water is delicious. Drink it up. I will descend from my soapbox. And uh, you, when you ask me what's the best question, you know, it's, that's what triggered that idea. I get, a, and I love it. I get a lot of questions, whether it's, you know, an elementary school I'm talking to or some, you know, fancy meeting in New York at some big hotel with some execs. You get crazy questions. And the, maybe the most frequently asked is around body function. You know, how do you go to the bathroom on the side of a mountain? I don't know why we're all fascinated, whether you're a dude in grade five or a CEO of a, of a Fortune 100 company. Man, how do you go to the bathroom up there? Uh, everyone's wondering. That's maybe not the best question, but it's certainly one of the most frequent. Certainly the, the, the best questions are the ones that catch you off guard. I think they're, they're the questions that make you think of something that you hadn't thought of. Uh, and it's off. I love doing Q and A. It's not always available when you're speaking at a conference because you know, the agenda's packed, but, and if there's 5,000 people, you can't do a Q and A in a big theater with 5,000 people. But if you have smaller groups and, and it's more intimate, you got a little bit of time and flexibility. I love doing a Q and A because you get these questions and the questions uh, allow you to, search through feelings and ideas that you really hadn't discovered for yourself and you can you know discover something new um, people have asked questions i think maybe the best ones that have caught me thinking were the ones that weren't about me or my experience but what does your mom think of this what do your friends think um, I, i've been married now for 22 years i have uh, two children my son's 19 and my daughter is 16 when they were first born, people would ask me questions about that. Yet I was still climbing. Our, our family, in fact, did the trek to Everest Base Camp when the, my children were nine and seven years old. Uh, we spent nearly a month. So we took a nice, slow itinerary uh, to get there. And so those are the questions that I've found maybe are the best ones, the ones that force you out of yourself a little bit and get you thinking in more broad terms, you know. Would you want your daughter to climb Mount Everest? It's that stuff. That's those are the good questions, the ones that stop you in your tracks. So yeah, for those of you that are hiking the the hike uh, virtually, um, yep, you just heard it. Jamie's seven and nine year old did the real thing, so we can do the virtual hike. I think because <laughs> uh, we won't get to a point where, well, maybe with our masks, where we're down to fifty percent oxygen, but. Um, uh, Look, Jamie, thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to leave with is, um, you know, you've been an extraordinary uh, supporter and, and friend of Planet Terror over the years. Um, and, and just wanted you to be able to share, you know, what it is a, about Planet Terror and our organization that, that has, you know, gotten you to volunteer your time and, and, and you know, give your hard-earned money to support what we're doing. Um, you know, what, what was it that, you know, drew you to us? Yeah, and I, and I wish I could, wow, that sounds lame. I should be doing more. So, and, and we should have done more earlier. And, um, you know, you th thank you for the, for the acknowledgement and the kudos, but I think it's easy to sit back and think, oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing pretty good. We did pretty good, especially back in the beginning. Um, but that's an easy way to, to not keep doing stuff. So I, uh, I owe you more. I owe Planetara more. Um, I think what, what was the great combination for me, and then I'm quite, not that I'm some fancy philanthropist with, 
you know, millions of dollars to, to float around. But I think we all have a responsibility to give back, regardless of where we are in our lives. If we have tremendous affluence and we can distribute that wealth, great. If we're pinching our pennies to, to make ends meet, we, we still need to find a place in there to contribute. And there's many ways to contribute, I think, not just with stroking a check, if you can, because I think money solves problems. Um, but by raising awareness, we can cure them. And that's maybe a little oversimplification, but that's kind of our family. My wife and I, we talk about, you know, how are we giving back? What's our purpose here other than our own hedonistic pursuit? Like, how are we giving back? What, what is this for, this life that we're so blessed to have? Um, and, and the idea of not just contributing with, with wealth, but with time or with knowledge or with experience or just being a sounding board, um, but really being of service to something. And obviously Planetara and the mission is just close to our heart. When you think about the impact of travel and the nature of the complexities behind the scenes, uh, especially when you start getting into guiding companies and then you know, in-country fulfillment, and it, it gets very complicated fast. And what we saw, what I saw, it, both professionally and personally inside of Plantera, is an organization that is trying to, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, break the walls down or fight a bunch of, uh, to make things more transparent because it's all evil and bad. It's not the case, but just trying to increase awareness for the traveler and for the industry as a whole, being a real thought leader around travel. And as a traveler, you know, educating me about the, positives and the potential unintended consequences of our of our existence in those places so sorry again for a long answer but i just felt like you and the team and the projects and the mission and the philosophy was really on point with being thoughtful about what we can do because we have this great opportunity and choice not everybody wants to travel There's lots of people would rather buy a sports car or lots of people would rather go you know, do something else with their free time and money. I, I would rather not have that new couch. I would rather go on a trip um, and, and make us thoughtful about where we are, where we're going, impact we have. Uh, and Planetara is just so uniquely positioned to do exactly that. Well, thank you, Jamie. Really appreciate your, your kind uh, words, uh, your support over the years and, and your time today uh, sharing with our audience uh, what it's really like to to, to, to both hike to Everest, but also to summit it. So uh, with that, a huge thank you and uh, cheerio. Take care. Good luck, everybody. We'll see you uh, in base camp.